This is the first part of a multi-part series on capnometry. This part focuses on sampling and measurement techniques. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. There are two different ways to sample respiratory gas for the purposes of measuring exhaled carbon dioxide, mainstream and sidestream. With mainstream capnometry, the measurement is actually performed on gas which is in the anesthesia circuit. The primary advantage of mainstream capnometry is the response time. You see the value almost immediately. Have you ever held your breath waiting for a CO2 waveform after a particularly difficult intubation? You wouldn't have to hold it so long if mainstream sampling was used. The primary disadvantage is that the measuring device, which is attached to the circuit, has some weight and unless properly supported, tends to pull the tracheal tube out. Sidestream sampling is the technique that has the greatest amount of acceptance. The primary advantages and disadvantages are exactly the opposite of those of mainstream sampling, specifically because the sample has to be aspirated from the circuit to the measurement device, there is a significant time lag before the results are available. On the other hand, the sampling device weighs next to nothing and so is not likely to result in displacement of the tracheal tube. As previously noted, mainstream sampling provides a faster response. Other advantages include an unchanged tidal volume. With sidestream capnometry, the monitor aspirates gas from the circuit and transports it to the site of measurement. This obviously results in a reduction in the delivered tidal volume. In most capnometers, the sampling flow rate is about 150 milliliters per minute. While this is probably not relevant in adult patients, consider a neonate. If the respiratory rate is 30 breaths per minute, that translates to 5 milliliters per breath that is delivered by the ventilator and measured, by, measured as inspired tidal volume, yet not delivered to the child. For a 3 kilo neonate with a preset tidal volume of 7 milliliters per kilogram, that amounts to a loss of 25% of the tidal volume. The absence of water condensation is also an advantage. Because the device is heated, no water condensation occurs. This is in contrast to a side stream capnometer where a water trap is necessary due to the condensation, and presence of water in a water trap can result in inaccurate readings. As previously noted, the sensor is heavy and its use can result in inadvertent extubation. In addition, the sensors are expensive. They are intended for reuse and not disposable. Inadvertently discarding the sensor results in increased expense in terms of replacement. Furthermore, because the sensors are reused, they must be sterilized between uses, again adding to the expense. Secretions may accumulate and plug the sensor, and burn injury may possibly occur because the sensor is heated. Furthermore, the mainstream capnometer has somewhat limited use since it cannot be used to measure end tidal carbon dioxide in spontaneously breathing on intubated patients. Because only the sampling line is connected to the circuit, there is essentially no added weight and thereby less likelihood of inadvertent extubation with sidestream sampling. Furthermore, sidestream sampling tends to be less expensive because there is no need for re-sterilization. Furthermore, in our practice, we have repeatedly demonstrated that we can't keep non-anesthesia personnel from throwing away reusable laryngeal mask airways. Compared to an LMA, the sensors for mainstream sampling are small, so it's essentially guaranteed that some would be thrown away, thereby increasing cost. One of the major advantages is that there are multiple different variations of nasal cannula, which allow connecting a CO2 sampling line and measuring exhaled carbon dioxide in spontaneously breathing on intubated patients. And finally, because the measurement is performed away from the patient, no heating occurs at the site of the patient and there is no risk of burn injury. There are disadvantages to side stream sampling. The sampling line has a small diameter and may become plugged with secretions. Furthermore, it may become damaged resulting in erroneous values. In addition, 
the water trap may become filled with condensation, resulting in inaccurate readings. The slower response time due to the need to move the sampled gas through the length of the sampling line to the measurement site is inconvenient when awaiting results to confirm correct placement of a tracheal tube. And finally, there's the loss of tidal volume that was discussed in the prior slide. Techniques of carbon dioxide analysis are based on the physical properties of the molecule. The rapid response time necessary for real-time measurements of carbon dioxide in respiratory gas imposes limits on the option for this determination. There are essentially three methods that have been used for making these measurements. Mass spectrometry was the first method used clinically to measure exhaled gases. The technique consists of ionizing the molecules in the sample, accelerating the resulting ions, and then determining the composition of the gas based on the mass to charge ratio of each molecule. The technique is capable of determining the concentration of volatile anesthetic agents as well as respiratory gases. Initially in clinical practice, one device would serve several rooms. If 10 rooms were connected to the device, your room would be only be monitored 10% of the time. Later, infrared capnometers were added to the mass spec with an infrared capnometer in each room so real-time measurements could be performed in each location. Raman scattering is primarily of historical interest. This was performed using a monitor known as the RASCAL. It was capable of measuring volatile anesthetic agents as well as respiratory gases. Raman spectroscopy relies on the fact that molecules absorb electromagnetic radiation and then re-emit that radiation at a lower wavelength. Based on the characteristics of the molecule, different molecules have different impacts on the wavelength. When using the principle of the Raman effect, also known as scattering, to measure respiratory gases and anesthetic agents, a laser was passed through the gas sample. By using filters which were unique for each gas, the concentration of carbon dioxide, as well as oxygen, nitrous oxide, and volatile anesthetic agents can be rapidly measured. Although the, neither the Raman scattering nor mass spectroscopy are currently used, they both offered the advantage of being able to detect nitrogen. That made them ideal for detecting air embolism. Assuming the patient was receiving only 100% oxygen or oxygen nitrous oxide mixture during the procedure, following an adequate period of washout, no nitrogen would be present in the exhaled gas. Entrainment of an air bubble, for example, during a craniotomy performed in the sitting position, would result in nitrogen being detected in the exhaled gas. This was the most sensitive method for detecting air embolism. Currently, the most common method of measuring respiratory carbon dioxide is based on the absorption of infrared light by CO2. In this method, the measuring device consists of two chambers, a reference chamber and a sampling chamber. Gas from the circuit enters the sampling chamber and infrared light is transmitted through both chambers. The infrared light causes the molecules to vibrate and absorb energy. After traversing both chambers, the light is filtered by a, narrow, by a narrow band pass optical filter to exclude changes created by other molecules and then measured by a sensor or detector. Because the maximum absorption of infrared light occurs at 4.2 and 4.3 micrometers, the sensor measures this wavelength. Since the reference chamber has no carbon dioxide, there should be no absorption of light at this wavelength. The most common method of measuring respiratory carbon dioxide currently in use is based on the absorption of infrared light by carbon dioxide. In this method, the measuring device consists of two chambers, a reference chamber and a sampling chamber. Gas from the circuit enters the sampling chamber and infrared light is transmitted through both chambers. The infrared light causes the molecules to vibrate and absorb energy. After traversing both chambers, the light is filtered by a narrow band pass optical filter to exclude changes created by other molecules and then measured by a sensor. Because the maximum absorption of infrared light by CO2 occurs at 4.2 and 4.3 micrometers, 
the sensor measures this wavelength. Since the reference chamber has no CO2, there should be no absorption of light at this wavelength. The previously discussed methods of analysis provide a quantitative analysis of carbon dioxide. Colorimetric CO2 detectors provide a semi-quantitative assessment based on a decrease in pH due to the presence of carbon dioxide. The detector can cease to function if it is covered in secretions or if the device is broken. False positives have been reported if the patient has recently ingested carbonated beverages and the tracheal tube is placed into the esophagus, or in the presence of gastric acid, for example, with aspiration of gastric contents. Additionally, intratracheal lidocaine and or epinephrine, both of which are acidic, have been reported to cause false positives. Note that the numbers on the label are percentages. The percentage reported cons corresponds to the percentage of atmospheric pressure. An exhaled carbon dioxide of 5% translates to a partial pressure of approximately 35 millimeters of mercury. The desirable characteristics of a colorimetric CO2 analyzer should include the use of a stable dye, which results in a rapid color change that is not red-green. That's because approximately 8% of the male population is red-green colorblind. The indicator should not be affected by nitrous oxide, volatile anesthetic agents, or water vapor. Obviously, a colorimetric device is difficult, if not impossible, to read in the dark. In the past, it was common to have an oral board question asking whether a colorimetric device is a suitable substitute for quantitative capnometry during an anesthetic. The answer is that it is not. That's the end of this part on capnometry. Stay tuned for another part. I hope you were able to learn something and enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.